All right, so today I'll be giving my uh, grow presentation on infusion side of care optimization. And for those that aren't aware of what this is, we'll walk through uh, the concept um, in, in depth. And I'll, I'll try to keep it at a, a high enough or high level conceptual level so that everybody can uh, grasp uh, what we're talking about here. This is something, slides that were adopted from my master's seminar presentation. And hopefully you all are able to take away a, a good bit of uh, practical information from it. <clears throat> so objectives for today, uh, we really just want to discuss the role of ambulatory infusion within health systems. So within UW Health, uh, we want to be able to evaluate alternate site of care infusion service models, um, describe operational and procurement considerations for ambulatory infusion therapy, and then outline uh, billing best practices and associated reimbursement models. So once again, um, I'll try to keep it very surface level and not go into too much depth to um, give you all practical takeaways throughout the presentation. All right, so starting off infusion therapy at a glance, right? When we think of infusion therapy, uh, these are some general concepts we tend to think of, right? So severe disease states, increased clinical monitoring, specialized clinical care, of course, it encompasses highly trained staff. So, um, you know, with that, we we automatically think hospital setting, right? Like, that's something we would automatically think. Um, but you know, increased increasing healthcare market trends allude to the opposite, right? So, when we think of these things, we think of the different sites of care now and how we are pushing infusion therapy to the ambulatory setting. So. Historically, we would see this in an inpatient setting, and now more so than anything, we're starting to see more and more of uh, these components um, of foreign fusion therapy being treated on an ambulatory setting. So uh, when we think of the health system market change that I refer to, we think of how inpatient, longer inpatient stays generally are associated to higher health system costs, um, and how health systems are looking for meaningful ways to drive length, length of stay down. And so one of the outlets to do this is ambulatory infusion. And with that being said, it provides convenience for the patients, right? You're able to be infused um, without being admitted, potentially in your own communities. And then also for health systems, it's less costly in general. So when we think about hospital outpatient department infusion, um, the first thing that comes to mind for me, uh, being affiliated with UW Health, uh, we I think about our infusion center that we have within University Hospital. For those that have not been, it's up on the third floor on the way to TLC. Um, many of you may have or may not have been, but this is the quintessential hospital outpatient department infusion center that we have within UW Health. And some common illnesses that you know we treat within this infusion center, of course, like chronic illness, uh, dehydration, uh, different anti-infectives, immune deficiency, rheumatoid arthritis, just to name a few. And you know some some services that we provide there: stem cell collection for our our BMT patients. We provide therapeutic phlebotomies, home infusion pump disconnection for our patients who are going home and will be infused in a home-based setting. Chemotherapy and in, in you know adjunctive care with our UW Carbone Cancer Center, just to name a few as well. So we do provide pretty comprehensive services when we think about the infusion therapy uh, that we can do on site here at CSC and uh, within our UH infusion center. When we think of uh, like patient benefits, right? So I always try to think of uh, patient facing aspects of of the care that we provide. It ultimately provides convenience and, and hospitality, right? So we're able to provide comfortable infusion bays in contrast to laying up in a hospital bed, uh, private areas to receive treatment. Uh, you're free of the general inpatient restrictions. And then when we think about hospitality, we provide entertainment options, right? Television, meals, uh, we have waiting areas for friends and family. And then we even have, you know, the option of reclining chairs during your infusion. So I'll bring up all of these pros, but you know, I'd like to ask you all, what are the cons? We talked about a lot of the pros of this and, and how this is a great alternative to inpatient care. Um, you know, but I, I'd like to ask a group of, you know, what are the cons, right? So that leads to our first discussion question. And, and once again, um, these are, you can put your thoughts in the chat box and we'll continue to move through the presentation. But 
Um, I'd like to see in the chat box, what do you all think are potential cons of hospital outpatient department infusion? And, you know, as thoughts come through the chat box, I'll try to take note. I have my laptop up and uh, try to address any of the comments that we have throughout the presentation. All right, so this uh, leads me into uh, the first segment of the presentation, which is the emergence of alternate sites of care, right? So I saw a couple of comments in the chat box, uh, travel time to the hospital is a con. Okay, that's definitely a con. I know I have speaking, spoken to David Zills, uh, one of our past directors, and he definitely noted that travel time to the hospital is a con. Lack of access to transportation. Yes, that's also a con for sure. So we'll dive into all of that. Um, so when we think of emergence of alternate sites of care, and we think of how initially patients were treated inpatient and now potentially are being treated in an outpatient setting, I wanted to start off with this third party payer scenario. So for example, we have Ando Insurance Company at, who rents a suite at every commander's home game for exclusive drinks of choice for each associate, right? So um, this is my insurance company. I'm a personally a commander fan and we have a suite. So the cost of each drink in this suite is 10 to $12. Um, you know, one game they realized Temple Insurance Company also has a suite on the other side of the stadium with the same exclusive drinks, but the only difference is they're paying two to $4. And so now me and my company, we're wondering why are we paying 10 to $12 for the same drinks that they're getting on the opposite side of the stadium for two to $4. I have to talk to Jack about that, but essentially that uh, that encompasses the alternate side of care conundrum that we see of today. And so in hospital outpatient departments, um, I provided cons and positives for maybe each uh, key stakeholder in this process. So patients, you have higher deductibles and potentially uh, higher out-of-pocket costs, which are negative for health systems. You have uh, more generally generate more revenue and uh, 340B rich opportunity. And then for payers and plan sponsors, it's a higher reimbursement rate. So I mentioned in that scenario, we were paying 10 to $12 for drinks because of the site of care. And in the hospital outpatient department setting, generally the reimbursement rates are higher for payers. So if they can pay less by maybe pushing patients to be uh, infused in an ambulatory setting, that's generally what they'll do. And so now we're seeing more, uh, an increased trend of payers moving patients or restricting uh, reimbursement for patients so that they can get infused at lower cost of care or lower sites of care. <clears throat> All right, so um, site of care, what is it? Uh, at a high level, what it, what it is, like I mentioned, is directing patients to the most cost-effective location while, uh, while maintaining optimal clinical care. Sometimes um, infusions, it's not warranted for patients to be infused in an ambulatory setting, given the high acuity of the situation or the patient's disease state. But when it's clinically appropriate, um, directing patients to, you know, once again, a lower side of care, a lower cost side of care. Um, so, of course, drugs like infusions can be administered at, at different places of service. And so place of service is a key term that will come up pretty often throughout the presentation as well. When we think of where it is or, you know, where... Uh, the infusion site of care can be uh, considered. We think of hospital outpatient department, which is what I already alluded to. We think of ambulatory infusion suites. So generally this is in conjunction with the home infusion provider. So a home infusion provider can also have an ambulatory infusion suite, which is on site. Home infusion, of course. So patients getting infused in the home-based setting. And this is something that we saw more and more of during the pandemic. Uh, given the infection control risk seen in the inpatient settings, there was a, a pretty robust increase in patients being infused in a home infusion setting. You have freestanding infusion centers. So these are places that aren't necessarily um, in direct in the direct vicinity of a health system, but are associated with health systems or, or may not be associated with a health system, depending on the makeup. And then some other options for patients, you have physician offices, uh, franchise infusion services, uh, one in the area, I believe, is is Metro, Metro Infusion, and different 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 other entities as well. So 
<clears throat> so why is infusion side of care important or why is this a topic, right? So I already mentioned the financial components of this, right? When we think of billing and reimbursement and uh, payers having to reimburse higher rates at, within a hospital outpatient department in contrast to reimbursing at a freestanding infusion center or potentially reimbursing within an ambulatory infusion suite. We think of the convenience, right? The convenience factor for patients. I, I mentioned it a little bit, but uh, navigating the nuances of getting to a hospital outpatient department infusion center or maybe not even having the transportation as we mentioned earlier. If patients can get infused in their home or maybe infused at a center that's down the street, that's something that we as uh, providers should should uh, consider. Quality of care. So as you all know, hospital volumes are steadily increasing. We're stretching resources. Um, is that compromising the quality of care? And if there are opportunities to maintain that quality of care in an outpatient setting, uh, we should be able to leverage those opportunities. And that's where side of care comes into play as well. And in developing trust amongst our patients, amongst our uh, key stakeholders in providing care, uh, this provides another avenue to do so and uh, definitely something that we should be aware of. And if you're providing services or directing the care of services within a health system, it's something to keep in mind. And then lastly, who is it, right? So who is it affected? We mentioned the patients. We mentioned our providers, of course, plan sponsors, and you'll know here pharmacy. Pharmacy plays a, a large role and the direction of this this type of care, this style of care, as we procure drugs, uh, we're involved in contracting, we're involved in clinical monitoring, patient education. I mean, we really see it all. And this is a huge opportunity for pharmacy departments to demonstrate value for sure. <clears throat> so all in all, the infusion side of care shuffle ramifications. And my, when I say shuffle ramifications, this is more so regarding Pair restrictions, so patients not being able to be infused in a site of choice because their their third party pair says, "Hey, you can't get infused here. You have to get infused here." And and you know the reasons behind that may be more convoluted than anything, but this leads to delayed and fragmented care. It can introduce patient anxiety, introduce risk points in supply chain, of course, and then it can undermine the integrity of existing workflows within health systems. So it can make things a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> All right, so now I'll just briefly try to, you know, highlight the, I guess, comparisons and, and contrasting points of, of different infusion models that you may see. And starting first with the ambulatory infusion suite. So once again, this is usually in conjunction with a home infusion provider. And so this can be co-located co within a health system pharmacy. And oftentimes uh, they can provide specialty and or home infusion services um, within the same entity that runs the ambulatory infusion suite. So in these settings, you'll have nurses who provide infusions. Generally, pharmacy, of course, is procuring the medications, compounding, things of that nature, also providing clinical monitoring. And um, on-site physician oversight is not required. So something that's interested, interesting to note here is that um, you can, or you, if you choose to have providers on site that oversee the, the practice within an ambulatory infusion suite, you're expanding your patient population to Medicaid and Medicare patients or government payers. But if you do not have physician oversight, then essentially what you're doing is you are uh, cutting out that patient population for those that were being reimbursed. So this is something to keep in mind as uh, we think about the care that we provide. Um, some other, I guess, key points to note within this 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 setting is um, it's generally higher accreditation standards. So uh, you have to get, uh, you know, potentially Joint Commission for Home Care Accreditation, ACHC, URAC, on top of the standard licensing that you may already need. Uh, so that's something important to note. And then generally, when we think of just procurement, pharmacy is involved in the contracting with insurance plans within this site of care. And I already mentioned the physician oversight component, so that's something to keep in mind. So when we think about the ambulatory infusion suite of a home infusion provider, advantages, of course, leveraging health systems, home infusion services, if already in service, it's 
an opportunity to retain patients within the health system, which is uh, uh, an advantage that you'll see across a lot of the different uh, side of care models. You have lower out-of-pocket costs for patients, and it could generally just be more cost-effective, right? The disadvantages here is uh, potential loss of revenue in comparison with hospital-based reimbursement. Once again, uh, payers are reimbursing at a higher higher rate within hospital outpatient department settings. And in the ambulatory infusion suite model, uh, you'll be getting reimbursed less, but you have to weigh the pros and cons between being reimbursed less or letting a patient go elsewhere and, and get care elsewhere. <clears throat> All right, home infusion is the second model that you'll see. Of course, I mentioned how the, the pandemic increased uh, the rate of or the number of patients being infused in a home-based care. So this provides what continuity of care, patient convenience is at the forefront here, right? No, no better place to receive care than the convenience of your own home sometimes. We're generally here targeting inpatient discharges, right? Being discharged from a acute care or inpatient setting to the home-based setting, but also here sometimes they'll accommodate, or for instance, UW Health, we accommodate uh, clinic referrals. And in this setting, of course, nurses uh, work in conjunction with pharmacy to provide clinical care in a home-based setting. So uh, nurses, of course, operating the infusion pumps and then working with pharmacy to you know, work through medication-related problems, interactions, understanding how to operate pumps, and all of the miscellaneous things that may go into home infusion. Some other things to know here um, for home infusion, once again, contracting generally is done at a pharmacy level and not a health system level. Um, most home infusion providers uh, work with CMS here, and they have to be certified with CMS. So um, home infusion does encompass uh, Medicare and Medicaid patients. Um, so it is not limited to just commercial payers as uh, the ambulatory infusion suite may be. So you have a, a wider patient population, but um, you generally have a smaller list of drugs which can be infused in a home-based setting, and that has to be approved depending on, you know, what your payer is. I know CMS has a, a, a pretty pretty tight list of drugs. So if you're looking to be, if you're looking, if a patient is looking to be infused in a home-based home care setting, you basically have to cross-reference with what will be reimbursed because you don't want to provide care and then not be reimbursed for it. So something to keep in mind up um, ahead of, the, of ahead of the goalpost, and then advantages and disadvantages here. Of course, receiving home infusion within your own home is a plus. Patients experience generally lower out of pocket costs, and then once again, the option to retain patients within the health system. Disadvantages within this this model, um, I mentioned how it's a pretty restrictive list of meds that can be provided. So, not everything can be provided in a home based setting or reimbursed in a home based setting. And you do have to account for additional expenses for, you know, nursing, product transport, home health procurement of the different supplies you need and things of that nature. All right, and then closing up with the, I guess the the last uh, alternate side of care model that you may see is a freestanding infusion center. So this can be found within a hospital owned building, but, um, it wouldn't necessarily be listed on the Medicare cost report. So it would be essentially listed as its own entity. So once again, this is ideally in prox proximity to an established health system compound and pharmacy, but it doesn't have to be. And when we think of, you know, a freestanding infusion center, I mentioned the restrictions or the additional accreditation that you may see if um, you're providing therapy in a home-based setting or if you're providing therapy in an ambulatory infusion suite. Here, you do not have additional licensing and accreditation requirements outside of those that you see in a provider clinic. So that's something to note, take note of. Um, additionally, when we think of like billing here, you're generally think of a place of service code, which would be 11. And uh, that is in reference to a provider-based clinic. And uh, when you think of a freestanding infusion center, generally procurement contracting is done at a health system level, but it is important for pharmacies to still be involved for sure. And advantages and disadvantages here, similar to before, you're retaining patients within the health system and providing another cost-effective uh, alternative for patients to provide care. 
disadvantages here is once again, potential loss of revenue. Um, you're limited to convert commercial insured patients unless you have provider oversight, which generally in this in this setting, you do have provider oversight. And then um, some insurance contracts will restrict further to specific infusion providers as they deem fit. So, all in all, that was a, a, a review of these three alternate side of care infusion models that you may see in an ambulatory setting. And it's important to note the differences between these three as health systems look to expand services. I think the biggest difference between now and maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, a lot of a lot of health system services were focused on the inpatient setting. And now as we move forward, it looks to be that more services are being um, pushed to the ambulatory setting. As this is uh, a way to retain patients within the health system, provide continuity of care and also generate revenue for you know, pharmacy departments, but also uh, provide high quality care for patients as well. So, all right, I'll pause here and um, I provided, I guess, a name that UW Health Affiliate Infusion Center game per se. So at the bottom here, we have our infusion bank, the different infusion centers that are affiliated with UW Health. And I'd ask for you all to try to match up each name to each specific um, infusion model, right? So we'll walk through this. When, when we think hospital outpatient department, what are, which of these, I guess, options would be considered hospital outpatient department infusion? I guess this is kind of like a quiz per se. The first one that we think of for hospital outpatient department, and feel free to put answers in the chat as well, UH Infusion Center, of course, as we already talked about. UW Carbone Cancer Center. That's uh, another hospital outpatient department infusion center. And then there's one more on the list here. The last one that we are noted here, and it looks like Grace in the chat box got it. Meritor, exactly. So Meritor is also a hospital outpatient department infusion center affili affiliated with our health system. Uh, Freestanding Infusion Center, out of the infusion centers listed here, it would be uh, One South Park here. So One South Park Oncology and Hematology Clinic, for those that have been out um, to One South Park, it's a, a pretty nice operation they have running over there. Um, home Infusion, I feel like this should be pretty straightforward for those that know. Home infusion would be UW Healthcare Direct, right? So this is our um, home infusion affiliate and they get all referrals from UW inpatient uh, for those that are being discharged for home-based care. And then the ambulatory infusion suite, this might be a tricky one, but if you were listening, as I went through the ambulatory infusion suite breakdown, uh, you'd recognize that this is also UW Healthcare Direct. So. UW Healthcare Direct, they do have uh, six chairs. So an infusion suite located on site within their corporate office over in Middleton. And this is also another place that patients can receive care. So uh, hopefully this helps to depict or uh, highlight a little bit about what I was talking about in the different sites of care that patients can be infused within UW Health. <clears throat> All right, so when we think about procurement considerations, uh, considering everything that we've already talked about, there are significant, uh, I guess, clinical ramifications, patient care outcomes that are directly tied to drug procurement. And so I, I feel the best place to start here, uh, for those that may not be aware, is the quote unquote bagging overview. So bagging is a term that is used to outline different procurement situations or, or different models. And so white bagging is deemed the practice of an external pharmacy supplying drugs or medications to a health system to then administer. So if you think of somebody maybe getting an infliximab infusion within UW Health, imagine that infliximab infusion being provided by an external pharmacy and then shipped to the health system to then administer. That would be white bagging. 
brown bagging is um, the practice of a patient bringing in their own medication that was provided by an external pharmacy to then be infused within a health system based infusion center. So let's say uh, Remicade, you have a patient who was shipped Remicade by an external pharmacy, and then that patient then brought their infusion into our infusion center to then be uh, infused by the care of our nurses and providers. That would be brown bag. And the patient actually had the medication and brought it into the site of care to get infused. Clear bagging is uh, a little, it's probably, in my opinion, better than white and brown bagging. This is the practice of, let's say, an integrated specialty pharmacy within the health system, providing the medication for infusion within an affiliated infusion center. So I think of, for instance, UW Health and Specialty Pharmacy providing the infusion for a patient to be infused at UH or something similar. And then of course you have direct buy and bill where you have providers or health systems who purchase store, administer and bill for the product. So this is something you'll commonly see with physicians who have independent practices. They might you know, direct buy and bill their products for patients who come into their offices and things of that nature. <clears throat> now it's it's important to note the the impacts of you know those different bagging scenarios and particularly this is denoting the overall impact of white and brown bagging. So we mentioned how white and brown bagging essentially there's an external pharmacy providing this drug for uh, patients who are getting infused within our health system. When we think about the impact of this, there was a 310 million per year or annualized costs across U.S. hospitals of the total financial impact that white and brown bagging had on operations and resources to manage these situations. So if you think about, for instance, somebody getting uh, infused within the chemo room uh, within the Carbone Cancer Center, and you know they are provided a medication from an external pharmacy, you have to think about shipping considerations, you have to think about storage, um, you have to think about the time in transit. Is it being stored in the in the right temperature? Is it even the right medication? These are all things that if one of those things go wrong, it might impact care and it will cause, you know, increased costs. So as you see here, 310 million was just quantified in additional costs. Um, 114 million was uh, attributed to additional resources and labor required to manage these situations. And considering both of those figures, it was also noted how 95% of hospitals included in his white bagging report had not even quantified the waste to the health system associated with it yet. So um, these figures are an estimate, but of course it's it's not it's not uh, particularly precise in the fact that this may even be higher. These costs associated with these situations may even be higher. And so uh, thinking about the top issues associated with white and brown bagging, 83% of respondents noted that, you know, the product did not arrive in time for the administration of the, the patient appointment. So you have a patient coming to Carbone, a two o'clock infusion appointment. The patient is there, but the drug is not. And so now you have situation where the patient can't even receive drug due to these white and brown bagging situations. 66% of respondents said the product was delivered with no longer correct. So you have to think about orders being placed and then between a week span of time, clinically situations can change and now the order has to be updated. Well, the order was updated, but the product is already in transit. And now what's being delivered is the wrong product. And now you have to go work through those issues that um, may come from that situation. 42% uh, reported the inappropriate or wrong dose was provided. 37% said the product was damaged. So you, you see the different situations that can arrive from uh, white and brown bag in any situations. And so it's, it's, it's definitely an issue that health system departments work through on a regular basis. And it's something that can really impact patient care and uh, really drive down patient outcomes, which is not something that we want to see for sure. <clears throat> so when we think of key stakeholder decision-making with just 
when we think about procurement in general, of course, providers. So since 2006, provider medication reimbursement overall has declined and, and much of the revenue for providers or up to 50% of the revenue for providers is due to medication related to therapy. So when you think about these different procurement situations that are tied or associated with uh, third party payers, and you think of potentially a provider in an ambulatory setting who runs his or her own practice or infusion practice, does he or she want to take on these additional nuances of providing care? Or would I rather just uh, affiliate myself with a health system who has the team, the resources in place to triage these issues and I can focus my effort on clinical care? These are some of the things that providers have to con uh, consider moving forward. Uh, additionally, patients, right? Costs for patients are increasingly and steadily rising. So premiums for family plans have, ri have risen 44% since 2011. Deductibles have risen 97% since 2011. And for specialty medications, the average copay can be roughly $100. Coinsurance can be 25%. So if I'm a patient, I want to receive care at whatever the whatever the lowest cost would be for me. And so if that's at a freestanding infusion center, if that's at One South Park, if that's at East Park Medical Center when it opens up, in contrast to going to UH, then by all means, that's what I want to do as well. And so beating the trend here, you see 25 to 30% of meds are filled via white and brown bagging, which is pretty alarming to me. So we want to make sure we're ahead of the ball here. And, and by beating the trend, you're outlining policies that uh, may define allowable procurement methods for infusion therapies. So, you know, many institutions have already developed these policies against white and brown bagging to minimize liability. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I want to, once again, I want to open this up for discussion and feel free to put your thoughts in the chat box as well. Do you agree with institutions developing policies to outlaw white and brown bagging altogether, given everything we've talked about? and why. So, you know, feel free to put thoughts in the chat box here if you agree with the outlaw of white and brown bagging. And then, you know, additional, I guess, think piece here is when would exceptions to these policies be potentially acceptable? <clears throat> so as, you know, we think about these scenarios or think about this question, I'd, I'd like to pose here, right, when we think about potentially acceptable scenarios in which maybe white or brown bagging may be acceptable, we think of situations where maybe the health system doesn't have access to a specific therapy. It could be a limited distribution drug in oncology. Uh, the majority of therapies are limited distribution, so maybe they don't have access to it. And because of this, and maybe considering the acuity of care, they will allow white or brown bagging. Um, maybe buying bill is not authorized by a patient's insurance. A patient may be approved for a patient assistance program or free drug through the manufacturer and the manufacturer is saying that they have to get it from us. And so we'll ship it to you. These are different scenarios in which, uh, white and brown bagging may be acceptable, but it's, once again, it's, it's important to outline which instances we're going to accommodate white and brown bagging and which instances we're not gonna accommodate white and brown bag. And if it's not written, then it's it's pretty hard to develop standard practices within your uh, health system. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, earlier, managed care is, is an important, or contracting in general is an important component to all of this. Um, you know, bigger companies tend to do blanket contracting for reimbursement, but it's important to have pharmacy involved in these conversations, of course, as we know the most about our meds, we know the most about our the clinical care that we're providing concerning the meds. And it's important to understand the return on investment or lack thereof before um, contracting with a certain third party payer and things of that nature. <clears throat> So contracting in this case is also important because it outlines billing practices necessary for medical and pharmacy benefit. 
and of course reimbursement as well is dictated by these contracts so um, medical benefit usually there are a lot of contracts and in pharmacy benefit you might have a singular contract or a few in particular uh, these are some terms you all may or may not be familiar with but it basically just describes the price for medication that we buy or that we uh, purchase within our health system and these are a few popular ones to name a few price index so you'll you'll see like average wholesale price essentially this is the published list price for drugs sold by wholesalers to retail or non-retail providers generally this is uh, deemed like the the more costly price index so if you see average wholesale price generally it's on the higher the pricier side uh wholesale acquisition cost so WAC. WAC is is also the manufacturer's list price to wholesalers but it doesn't it doesn't reflect rebates and discounts um so although WAC might be lower than a awp uh, it doesn't take into consult into consideration those rebates and things of that nature and because of that, ASP was developed. So ASP is the cheapest of the three noted here. And it accounts for drug rebates and things of that nature uh, for manufacturers, average price to purchasers and, and things of that nature. So uh, you also see MAC, the Federal Upper Limit, NADAC, to name a few. But uh, key takeaway here are these are just some different terms you might see when you think about the costs for medication and depending on uh, what the price index is, the price for that drug may be different. <clears throat> a lot of you may recognize courts. So um, courts, I have courts insurance now since moving to Wisconsin for residency, uh, but courts is the managed care commercial affiliate for UW Health. And most health plans do side of care due to hospital markups, but courts has a different approach actually. So, um, Courts, they used to reimburse on a percentage charge basis, but now they reimburse via capitation. So uh, once again, for those that are not aware, in Dane County, uh, courts re reimburses on a capitation basis, and capitation refers to um, a patient being associated with a certain a diagnosis. And because of that diagnosis that maybe they were admitted with or uh, whatever they are being treated for, courts will provide a set payment for that patient. And so the course of therapy for patients under the same, uh, associated with the same diagnosis can look different, but you'll see the same, you'll be reimbursed the same amount for these patients. And so that's what courts does in Dane County. They capitate or they, they cap the payment depending on the categorization of the patient. Um, and then courts, they, they utilize different um, methods to, I guess, help protect um, prescribe, prescribe prescription rights amongst providers. They, they, they utilize these different methods to uh, manage care, right? And to ensure that patients are being prescribed the most cost-effective therapies in conjunction with their treatment regimen and things of that nature. So here I provided a screenshot of, you know, prior authorization criteria for Zogensma, right? You see criteria for coverage, and essentially this is court saying, before we're going to authorize Zogensma for this patient, we want to make sure that they fit the criteria so that we're not spending money when uh, we're not spending, let's say, $2,000 when we could be spending $20 here. Did we walk through each opportunity or every step in the, in the course of therapy for this patient? And this is their way of uh, ensuring patient convenience. Um, if you talk to courts, uh, stakeholders, or if you know Pat Corey, you'll you'll understand that he always reverts back to patient convenience being the center of discussion for everything that courts does. <clears throat> Other things to take note of here, Health System 340B implications, right? So 340B essentially is a program provided by uh, the government that allows health systems to stretch resources. That was the intent of 340B. And this allows us to purchase drugs at a cheaper price, 340B price. And of course, there are different things that go into that. But uh, when we think about implications, 
of infusion therapy, um, if patients are getting infused at a 340B eligible location, that allows us to purchase drugs at the lower cost. And as we generate savings over time, we can use those savings to increase maybe the services that we have, or maybe uh, acquire more staff, more resources. That's the intent of the program. And so when we think about site of care and where patients are going to be infused, this is something that we think about as well, how we can optimize the business of pharmacy and still provide high quality patient care to leverage these resources to gain more. So all in all, when we think, you know, overview of some of the things that I talked about regarding procurement, there are a number of different factors to consider when deciding upon um, an infusion procurement method for your health system. One workflow may not be feasible for all, depending upon insurance and drug manufacturer restrictions. It's, it's can vary by site and vary by health system. So it's important to make sure that pharmacy representation is present because once again, we have the most knowledge in this arena. And then drug procurement is constantly evolving. It's always evolving. You hear about drug shortages, you hear about um, the market trends that change on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot of these external factors affect our day-to-day -day practice behind the scenes. And it's important to stay up to date with these practices so that we can provide uh, quality patient care as we do. All right, I'll close out with uh, revenue cycle integrity. And once again, I'll, I'll try to breeze through this given the time uh, left that we have, but um, uh, revenue cycle essentially is preventing the following that you see noted here. A thorough and efficient revenue cycle process prevents one claim denial, and then it also uh, prevents repayment issues. So the worst thing, I mean, from a business standpoint is, you know, you're you're taking on patients and you're providing care and then you're not able to be reimbursed for the care that you provide. And what that does is now your your service is losing money and now you you potentially are putting yourself out of business and you can't provide the care to your patient populations in the community that you would need to. So yes, the clinical care is tied directly to um, the business aspect. And so it's important for health systems to have a dedicated team that is focused on this revenue cycle integrity so that we can ensure that the services we're providing, we're getting reimbursed for, and we're not putting ourselves out of business. <clears throat> I thought this would be cool to include. So, you know, I had the opportunity to work with UW Healthcare Direct, which is our home infusion affiliate for UW Health, and they have a process referred to as a uh, life of a, of a referral. And so once again, like I said, they get all referrals from UW inpatient. And from there, they can, re they can take the referral and they can leverage their services to provide care with UW Healthcare Direct Home Infusion and or Ambulatory Infusion Suite, or they could kick it to an external infusion provider and have them deal with it depending on the patient and the insurance and, and different things of that nature and what was written for and stuff. So this is a depiction of what that process looks like. So you have intake, basically somebody who uh, collects all of the patient demographic information and all of the information necessary to then triage. They have a reimbursement coordinator who analyzes their third party insurance and understands, hey, will they reimburse us for this care or reimburse us for this prescription? or will we not be reimbursed for this? So once the reimbursement coordinator either approves or disapproves of that patient referral, nursing will get it, pharmacy will get it. And then that's where you start coordinating clinical care. You start uh, addressing medication therapy needs, clinical aspects, and uh, everything that a patient will wanna know when you know being infused in a home-based setting. Because once again, a nurse may not always be there. So it's important to understand the clinical ramifications of the therapy you're getting. And then lastly, they have a patient service coordinator who really touches base with the patient on a recurring basis after they've established care. And these are all the people who fortify um, optimal care within a specialty infusion setting. But the most important when we think about here in revenue, inti revenue cycle integrity, the pharmacy reimbursement coordinator, and then also our, our billing team. 
right? So you want to verify the patient's eligibility prior to providing service. You want to make sure the prior authorization and pre-authorization is taken care of so that you could then bill for service that you know you'll be reimbursed for. And so this is important to have these staff in place to make sure this is happening. Um, at a high level, when we think about um, billing and things of that nature, you have essentially two buckets. You have medical benefit billing and you have pharmacy benefit billing. For the sake of details here, medical benefit generally is um, reimbursed at a higher rate than pharmacy benefit. And that's something you could uh, keep in mind here. And you have your different codes that are associated with different settings. <clears throat> uh, billing hierarchy. Um, I guess takeaways here, you have different categories of, of medications. So chemotherapy is probably your, your uh, highest noted therapy that you could get or biologics. So there's a hierarchy here and it starts with chemo, biologics, and then it goes down to like therapeutics and diagnostics. And then at the bottom of the food chain, you see like hydration, right? And then route of administration is also in the hierarchy for that. So you have IV infusions, then you have your IV pushes, and then you have your injections. And so um, most of you would never <laughs> probably ever have to know this stuff. Um, but if you're interested to know more, I'm happy to go into more detail. But this is the hierarchy when you think of infusion billing in these settings. Uh, and this is for medical benefit fee for service only. This is not... Uh, really touching into a lot of different areas. And so when you think about, once again, like I just said, they break it down by different uh, service codes or Hicks fix codes and billing is done by your infu in initial infusion. And then you have your secondary infusions. You have, uh, it's broken down by specific hours of infusion. And so time here and the specific medication that you're receiving is super important. And that's why nurses document times when they start the infusion when they stop it, and things of that nature because this all goes into billing so that you can be reimbursed for your service uh, high level takeaways here um, there are time parameters once again for the infusion so if an infusion is less than 15 minutes it's coded as an iv push if it's longer than 15 minutes it could be billed as an infusion for one hour in order to be billed for additional hours, it has to exceed that 31 minute mark, which I'll show you examples of what it means in a minute. And so once again, start stop times are important and it's important to note, you know, which therapies are being provided so that you could be uh, reimbursed in an appropriate manner. So some examples, right? If you have a patient who comes into Carbone and they're infused for 14 minutes, that is only billable as an IV push because it doesn't exceed that 15 minute mark. 16 minutes at that point would then be billable for one hour of infusion. 60 minutes, hour of infusion. Hour 28, still an hour of infusion because it doesn't see that 31 minute mark. But if you have a patient who's infused for an hour, 31 minute mark, uh, 31 minutes is billable for two hours. Once again, some um, pearls that you probably never will have to use, but important to know. Uh, and this is a case example, right? So you have a patient who has Medicare Part B coming into an office-based setting to be infused, Remicade, Solumedrol, and Benadryl. Uh, this is essentially what teams would work through and documenting. So this is only for office-based settings and maybe hospital outpatient departments as well, but they work through this infusion um, therapy hierarchy, and then they associate medications with the different codes, right? So we mentioned the timing, they would just, they would document the time of the infusion, understand how many billable hours, and then they'd associate it with the proper code that would um, allow them to submit for payment on the back end. And so um, this is basically just walking through what those codes would look like and how it aligns. Solumedrol being a therapeutic, it will be a sequential infusion, low level, and they would just kind of like work through and document each of these codes so that they could be reimbursed, right? Other models that we really didn't talk about today, uh, NDC billing for medical benefit, NDC billing for pharmacy benefit, and then also um, diving into more of the capitation model, we kind of talked about it. Um, key takeaways, once again, that last segment, the billing and reimbursement, I understand I probably lost a good amount of you, um, but it was something I provided to our master's cohort uh, for our department, I understand. But generally key takeaways for you all today, Cytocare operational considerations, always important to start with the patient in mind to optimize patient convenience uh, whenever we can. 
it's good to strategically gauge the pros and cons of the different sites of care in which we provide infusions to accommodate service expansion. It's important to categorize problems related to site of care with policy. So you have written policy that outlines and helps standardize care. You align your site of care solutions with key stakeholders. Understand your patient population, understanding your payer mix, your local uh, network, and then fortifying your revenue cycle so that you're not providing care and not getting paid for it because that's not good. Uh, next steps in future direction, when we think about just site of care in general, um, more pricing transparency for all key stakeholders, I think that's always a good thing. Well, oh, it's a good thing for patient care. Uh, can't speak for other stakeholders. Um, continue side of care policies by plan sponsors. So once again, we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to analyze these. There will likely be more infusion billing on the pharmacy benefit. And this is once again, due to payer restrictions, moving um, reimbursable care to pharmacy benefit, which is paid at a lower rate. So they're essentially saying we want to pay you uh, two to three dollars for those drinks instead of ten to twelve dollars for those drinks by moving them from medical to pharmacy benefit. Um, consumer demand for convenience and equity, right? Patients want to uh, receive care in the most convenient place possible, and that could be the home, that could be their community. And so, understanding this demand, uh, we should take steps in health systems to help meet that demand. And then, at a high level and a policy level, continue legislation surrounding. Uh, care in this setting. <clears throat> Something to to keep in mind, or um, I guess exciting things to keep in mind for the upcoming year in 2024, East Park Medical Center will be opening. And so East Park Medical Center is going to be a 469,000 square foot ambulatory facility on the east side. So for those of you that have been to East Madison Hospital or know where it is, it's located right across the street from East Madison Hospital. They'll have uh, 70 plus infusion bays within this facility and 75% of current UH oncology volume will be going to this facility. And so um, with the opening of East Park Medical Center, 75% of current oncology volume at UH will be going here. Um, all oncology volume at One South Park will be moving here as well. So uh, One South Park oncology will no longer be a thing. And then the remaining infusion volume will be non-oncology infusion. So uh, this is something to keep in mind um, over the next year and how that may affect your practice. <clears throat> and another pop quiz question, if you think about East Park Medical Center, I guess what category of um, what infusion model would this be based off of if you were paying attention? Feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, I guess bonus points for whoever gets this correct. And that concludes my presentation today. Once again, thank you all for sticking it out, hanging in there with me. Um, some of the stuff you might have gotten, some of the stuff you may not have understood, and that's okay too. But if you want these slides, I'm happy to provide them to you. I uh, do also want to provide a special thanks to uh, Susan Kleppen, Director at UW Healthcare Direct. She helped me out a lot. I learned a lot from her. Uh, Erica Diamantidis, Specialty Pharmacy Manager at UW Medicine. So this is not to be confused with UW Health. This is in Washington, Seattle, I believe. Brian Schusler, another uh, professional colleague involved in uh, specialty pharmacy, and then also Pat Corey, Director of Pharmacy at Courts Health. So 